That is not Japan. <laughs> we did fly over Alaska on the way, so evidently this is a photo from that part of the trip. So uh, how many of you consider yourself to be a one percenter? Uh, in our country, that is a definition of those that are uh, wealthy and uh, are part of the upper crust of our society. In Japan, a one percenter is somebody that follows Jesus Christ and knows them as their Lord and Savior. Ninety-nine percent of people in Japan do not know Jesus as their Savior and likely don't even understand what that means. So uh, our, a lot of people have asked me, why did we go to Japan? We went to Japan because people there don't know Jesus. And so our theme verse for going was uh, if, uh, First Chronicles uh, chapter 16. And so we went there to declare uh, the glory of Jesus. And so we are so excited that we were able to do that. Although this is a beautiful picture we took as we were going through one town, um, it also points to the lack of hope. These people are releasing lanterns as a, um, uh, an act of worship towards a, a deity that we don't follow. So uh, while it's pretty and it, and it is uh, certainly a, an interesting sight, it does point to the lack of hope that is often found in the people of Japan. So obviously we're all here that uh, went to, uh, uh, to Japan and you can see uh, uh, our names are listed uh, in order. It, and, uh, this was at a park in downtown Tokyo and it was certainly beautiful, but uh, frankly, uh, Tokyo is a town of 40 million people uh, living extremely uh, close together. And we're gonna uh, learn more about that uh, as we go today. But uh, we wanna start off by saying on behalf of all of us, thank you for being a part of our trip. Uh, we had the support uh, of, of people praying for us regularly. We had people drive us to the airport. We had uh, people give financially. Uh, I can't uh, thank the number of people. We had somebody uh, sit, uh, house sit for us while we were gone. Um, this trip was something that we would not have been able to do on our own. The other thing is, why seven? Why did, uh, why did seven people go? Because that's the number of seats Janet Brown has in her van. <laughs> not eight. Not six. She has seven, and it's room for just enough luggage. If anybody wants to know exactly what kind of luggage to bring, ours fits precisely in that band. So we'll be able to explain that uh, as we go. So uh, we were only in Japan on one particular on a Sunday. Uh, we left on a Monday and came back on the following Sunday. So we only got to go to a traditional church service one time we were, while we were there. Uh, this is a, a church in uh, Scuba, and um, this, as you can see, the entire church is in the is in the picture. So uh, you probably heard me say this before. Uh, if you didn't realize it, First Baptist Church is a mega church by Japanese standards because most churches in Japan have around 30 people that attend on a given Sunday, and their uh, their sanctuary or place of worship is about the size of one of our traditional classrooms that we have here at First Baptist. While, um, while we only uh, went to a church service once, we spent the entire week with our church. And what I mean by that is the Church of, of Japan. Um, this is outside of another church, uh, is that Kadaira, I think? I, I can't quite see. And uh, one of the things what we were able to do is we were able to go around and, and visit uh, a lot of the uh, churches and participate in their ministries. As you know, we went to uh, sing with a choir, and you're going to hear more about that here in, in a moment. But really what we were able to do was to come alongside of the church in Japan as they ministered, as they reached uh, their community. And what a privilege it was. Um, and we were able to uh, spend a lot of time with, uh, uh, with people while we were over there. And that was really the crux of our ministry. So um, I don't know if you know, what, do you know which, uh, which one is me and which one is you? Uh, I'm, in the, I'm, in the, uh, I'm on the right in the yellow shirt, and that's me, and the, and the gentleman on the left is you. Why you? And uh, you is somebody we met over in uh, Japan while we were ministering in a park to a group of men as we were helping them in learning English as well as in discipleship. He's a, a, a man that uh, was living on the streets and through uh, the ministry of one of our, uh, the Southern Baptist missionaries over there has come to know Jesus as a savior and now has uh, 
in learning English as well as uh, starting a new career. And uh, we were just excited to be able to spend time alongside of others. And uh, he was a disciple making disciples as he was ministering to other men there. Um, on our day off, we didn't get to see giraffes, unfortunately, <laughs> or, or elephants. But what we did, uh, we were able to do is we were able to spend some time learning how to write kanji, uh, write kanji, which is the uh, written language in, in Japan. And it was a, uh, fun to be able to spend some time uh, uh, actually, uh, not just learning the, the strokes of, of the characters, but to understand a little bit more about the background. I was excited. I was able to write the word truth and uh, uh, with my symbol. And it was uh, uh, challenging as I sat there for an hour working on that one letter to think about what truth is. Because in Japan, uh, truth is not uh, all... all is not defined as the Bible. It's often defined as millions upon millions of gods. And it was uh, exciting to learn that. The last thing is uh, we saw lots of interesting signs while we were in Japan. And I don't know if you can quite see, but uh, the one in the bottom right-hand corner was found at a restroom. And I've learned that uh, it is not advisable to fish in the toilets in Japan. In fact, it's against the law to do such things. So um, I, I'm suggesting, John, that we put that in our own bathrooms here at First Baptist. No fishing, please. Um, the restaurant in the upper right-hand corner was called Gas Panic, and uh, we chose not to eat there. I'm just gonna leave it out there. And then the upper left-hand corner was a sign at a park we were at, and evidently there's no trumpet playing in that park, if you can see that in the upper right-hand corner of that sign. So um, these have no deep theological meanings other than please don't fish in the bathrooms. Okay, so um, of course we got there all in one piece. We, we, oh no. um, so we got on a plane, we left our house at four in the morning to get on the airplane and uh, they drove us there, so that's DIA. And we got on our plane with Seth Stanley. Um, it was a... Um, two hour flight to Dallas and then a 13 hour flight over to Tokyo where um, Janet Brown met us at the airport which was so comforting and since there were so many people there. Okay, so uh, we got there and this is the train station near the our, the place that we stayed. Um, okay, okay. <laughs> despite the city being extremely crowded, um, they said 40, over 40 million people, it was in people just everywhere. It was very quiet, which was kind of weird, and very, and like super organized and extremely clean. They really value cleaning and everyone picks up their trash, picks up other people's trash. You can find the hard trash, hardly find trash cans anywhere because there's nowhere to put stuff, but the city of Tokyo itself is really, really big. Um, we, from the heart of Tokyo, which there kind of really isn't, but like it's just city everywhere, but we drove t two hours and it was just as dense everywhere like no difference in the population, population and stuff. Um, you can walk about 15 minutes from anywhere and get to a train station or subway anywhere, which is crazy because like you have to drive 15 minutes to get to the light rail here <laughs> and it doesn't make sense. But um, on the left, yeah, that's um, a street in Tokyo. It's not, you would think it's an alleyway, but it's actually like a pretty well running street. It's not a one way street either. It can be two way and like, Cars like go right up next to each other within like inches, and like some people scrape the walls on accident and stuff. So that's pretty great. <laughs> okay, so this is where we stayed. Um, it's a guest house that um, this missionary's son uses for about a month of the year, but for the rest of the year. Um, he gives it for short-term teams to stay while they're in Japan because it's hard to find places, as you could assume, with 40 million people. It was very cool, and you would think that it's like a one-story house and it's pretty chill, but um, it's actually the fourth story of a house. There's three houses underneath this one, um, and behind the house is a river, so the windows of the houses underneath face towards the river, and it's like parking garage stuff. It's pretty crazy. Um, this is the, so that was the front of the house, but if you look the other direction, this is the front of the house, or like the yard kind of thing. 
and it has like a little sidewalk and grass, and then that's the neighbors, and yeah, we're talking to Janet in her super cool van that fits eight people, precisely. <laughs> Um, we also stayed with another team while we were there. Um, they were from the Philippines, and they were also doing this choir ministry. Um, so we decided, that, well, we were there during the 4th of July, so we decided to throw a 4th of July celebration for them and have an American-style party, which was pretty great. Um, yeah. So I'm going to address the religious temperature of Japan. So we went to see a temple and we went to see a shrine. This is the entrance to a Buddhist temple and it's a giant gate and on either side of the gate you'll see these gods of thunder. And so you can see them and they're in the right order. The one on the left was on our left as we were going in, the one on the right was on the right. When you get through the gate they're also on the other side and they look different because Buddha can take on different forms and sometimes Buddha can be a woman. So on the back was a woman. But what struck me the most about these is the fear that I felt when I saw these. Um, that's not the picture I have of God in my mind, but that's the picture they have of God. And the ones on the back had horns and tails and they're just very demonic looking instead of godlike looking to me, but that's the first thing that you see. Thank you, Megan. That's the temple behind. You see the girls there. As we walked, you walk through a marketplace where they're just selling a bajillion things and there's a ton of people. And then you get to the temple area and the marketing doesn't stop. It just changes from things you might want to have to things that you buy in order to get your favor answered by Buddha. And they don't call them prayers, they call them wishes. And before you get to give your wish to Buddha, I, I wish I would have counted, but I think it's eight to 10 things that you do before you get there. You, you know, rattle these things, you go through incense and they have to put it on themselves. They try to get it everywhere around themselves. They have to wash, they buy prayers, they buy these little paper things and they fold them a certain way and they hang them on something. Um, it's just, the amount of things that they do, and then when they get up the stairs, they clap really loudly because Buddha might be asleep and they have to get his attention. And so they clap loud, they throw money in this kind of, well, kind of a grate kind of thing, but it stands up, and it clangs down into the bottom where the Buddhist priests would collect it. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, they're standing, they're over in the right in kind of like this ticket booth. If there's some extra favors you want to buy that might cost in the hundreds of dollars, you can buy those from the priests over here. And then you ask your wish from Buddha and you are hoping that he's in a really good mood and will grant you what you want or not grant you what you're afraid of. Oh, this is the video. Okay, all right, so this is a video that, um, it's not translating to the computer, right? Oh, there it kind of goes. So you can kind of see, there's the incense and see how the people are fanning it onto themselves. And if you could hear, while this is going on, there's this, these clanger things, like clanging, 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 it's, it's, you know, they're just trying to get Buddha's attention. Um, so they go through a lot of things in order to do that. Okay, so um, on the left is the entrance to a shrine, and on the right is the temple. And this entrance to this shrine is a different shrine we went to on a different day, but it's real park-like when you walk up there. It's absolutely beautiful. But then when you get to the shrine, it's, again, uh, for me, kind of depressing because you just see the hopelessness in um, what they worship. And um, so in the Buddhists, they worship Buddha, but Buddha can change form, as I said, so he can take on a bajillion different forms. In the Shinto religion, they worship eight million million gods. So in other words, it's another way to say that everything can be a god in the Shinto religion. And so, I mean, it's just astronomical in your mind what you could be worshiping at that moment or the next given moment to have that many gods. This, um, I think for all of us, but I know for myself, was the most impactful thing. Um, so you see those Buddhas with the red on them. What do you imagine those are? Throw some ideas out to me quickly. Hmm. Sorry? Bibs. bibs. They are bibs. Those are baby Buddhas. And um, so when we asked Janet, you know, why do they have baby Buddhas? 
Um, what do you think her answer was to us? Why do you think they have baby Buddhas? It has to do with children, and, and when they go to these baby Buddhas, what do you think they're doing? They must be feeding them. I'm sorry? Are they feeding them? Feeding them? Uh, fertility. Fertility? Um, so over in Japan, um, sex is just a real free thing. Um, they will have affairs, young girls, if they want some money, they'll go sell themselves, get some money, go buy themselves something, and nobody thinks twice about it. So there's a lot of unplanned pregnancies, and so their top form of birth control is abortion. And so there are just an astronomical number of aborted babies. So they have these baby Buddhas, oh, okay. and um, they come to the baby Buddhas, but they're not asking for forgiveness that I aborted you. They're saying, please don't um, bring bad or evil on me or my family or my family line because I aborted you. And it just, I, I don't know, it just, whew. Um, it was sad to me on so many levels. And the, what that represents in babies' lives and the hopelessness that people are looking to that to not have evil in their lives is, uh, it's very sad, sorry. Um, anyway, uh, the religious temperature in Japan is very difficult. It typically takes 10 years of very intense work to bring someone to Christ. And um, one of the pastors while we were over there said, was talking about you know the sheep and how God left the 99 to go look for the one over in Japan. They often have to leave the one to go find the 99 um, because the numbers are so overwhelming. And one of the other things that struck me as a believer over there, one of the gals that I met, she and I, she was a believer, and she and I were just talking about the goodness of God. And she said, Connie, I know you guys didn't come over here for me, um, but to be able just to talk to you about this kind of thing, you have no idea yeah. how encouraging this is to me and how impactful. So our Christian brothers and sisters over there are very lonely, and um, it's very uh, hard ground to till. Janet Brown has been a missionary in Japan uh, for 30 years, and our church um, has been one of her supporting churches for just as long. On Janet's uh, last two home assignments, um, she came to our church and she reported on her new role as a short-term missions coordinator for Japan. Um, we felt the nudge to take advantage of her expertise in short-term ministry trips to help us get out of our comfort zone. Janet had been praying for years that a team from First Baptist would come so that she was beyond encouraged when we came to Japan to serve. Well, we were told that there's nothing like having one of your own supporting churches um, come to share in your ministry in the country where you are living and serving. Uh, Janet... Um, Jen accepts teams or individuals who are ready to come for two weeks to two years. The purpose is threefold. One, maybe a short-termer will discover Japan as their new um, place of ministry. Or two, maybe the short-termer will feel the call to do ministry in someplace else. But for all, all short-termers will have a new opened eye to praying for missions and telling others the need for spreading the gospel. Japan, or sorry, Janet also uses her gift of making stained glass windows to make the Christian churches in Japan beautiful. This window um, that you see here um, was at a church near where we stayed. Uh, she had made it uh, for one of their original buildings, but the church was rebuilt and they moved it and they placed it in this new position here you see. Um, each of her stained glasses tell a story, and here the cross in the middle is clear because through, um, 
because of Christ, God can see right through to us. Um, she's currently working on several panels for a church in Fukushima. Fukushima is where uh, the tsunami in 2011 hit really hard, and that's the town where the uh, nuclear reactors are. Um, that town is still being rebuilt, and one of their churches there is just now getting a new building put together, and she's making several panels for them at this point. <clears throat> so Janet joined us up with some other missionaries that were doing various types of outreach in the Japanese community. Here we're at the home of Asa and Greg Swenson. Um, they are new to the field and are um, hoping to plant a new church in Tokyo. We went inside their home um, and we met a few Japanese people there to practice English conversation and we discussed the Bible topic of creation. Um, it's a very um, unusual, unusually hard topic there because um, they, most Japanese are believers of evolution. Anyways, that day we had the privilege of having uh, another missionary, Catherine, with us. She's the one standing, um, looking like she's leading the presentation there. She was um, g giving kind of a interesting facts about her home country of Canada. It was Canada's birthday that day, so that was part of our English um, conversation that day. Um, and that evening, um, Catherine uh, went with us and her husband um, for dinner, and she was telling us how hard it is um, to be a missionary in Japan. Um, they were they were weary, um, like like Connie said that it takes ten years for someone to come to a faith in in Christ, and um, they said they felt like Japan was a missionary graveyard because people come and they try so hard and um, they feel like there's no results. So and good missionaries leave. So, um, yes, we need to be praying for them. Um, they also said that um, reaching the Japanese is very difficult because um, they work so hard. Men are working six days a week. Children are going to school six days a week. They only have one day off, and that's the day that they just either sleep or catch up on home duties. Um, so for someone to come to church or to do something with people is somewhat unrealistic. They just don't have time to do it. So it seems that their ministries seem to touch mostly women because they're the ones who are more available during the day. But their hopes is that maybe through the women that they'll reach the men. Um, and it was great to have Lynn and Garrett with us there because the few men that we did interact with were just so happy to have other men. It was, it was really great. Um, um, next. Okay, here we are with another missionary, Mark Bennett. We're doing um, what's called a sidewalk chapel. We tried to find where the chapel was and then we realized it's not a building. It's um, just a meeting place. <laughs> We're here with the homeless. Um, so we led, a, or Mark led a church service and then Afterwards, um, we did feed them, and there was a time where we did do English studies with them. So there was five men out of that group of all those homeless that um, wanted to invest in learning English. So what amazed me about um, the work in Japan was that my thought was, here's Janet Brown, missionary to Japan, just thinking like she was covering all of Japan by herself. Very naive of me. There's many missionaries there. When we saw them all working together, it was um, quite a network. And they all knew what each person's specialty was, and they worked together. Um, and at first I was like, why are they sending so many missionaries to Japan? But then you realize there's not enough missionaries going to Japan. Um, and our last... Uh, the one right before there. Um, here we are at the headquarters in Japan for World Venture, and the man by the screen is Ken Taylor. 
he's the field director for all the missionaries in Japan. And at this evening event, we're all praying for um, the upcoming Hallelujah Black Gospel Music Concert that we were going to participate in. Okay, so um, here's us with Ken, and this was us going to one of our mini choir rehearsals. Um, Ken was a great help. He um, led us around the whole Tokyo area to, uh, I think, seven different choir rehearsals. And um, without his help, we probably wouldn't have been able to find them, as <laughs> they were anywhere from small churches to top-level train station or some random community center that you didn't even notice. But um, although each choir we visited had a different regular director, um, Ken Guest conducted these practices in preparation for the final concert. Um, as participants in the choir, we were able to help the Japanese people with their pronunciation of English words in all the songs since they were all in English and they were learning a brand new language of things that they didn't really understand. So they would all get these um, little booklets that had all the words and it didn't have any rhythms or notes or anything, it just had the lyrics. And then on the other side of the page, there'd be an explanation in Japanese of what it meant so that it, they weren't just singing something that they didn't really understand. Um, at the rehearsals, Ken made sure that all of us were spread out so that we wouldn't um, sit by each other or um, so that we could um, connect with the people around us. And um, oftentimes we would share a meal after rehearsal, and this was a really good opportunity to talk with them and share about our lives. Um, at this choir on the screen, uh, Susie was able to share her testimony with the help of the translator, who is the um, woman in the colorful shirt. And um, the people were very interested in what she had to say. And none of them seemed to be uncomfortable, even though about 80% of them um, are not believers. Um, so at the final concert, there were over 400 participants, and um, these next three pictures are us individually in the choir out of this huge crowd. So, is it 80% are not believers, but they're still singing gospel songs? <laughs> All their might. Yep. Yeah. They're actually paying to sing them. To sing them. They, there's 60 choirs across uh, Japan, and they, uh, on average, spend 10 to 20 dollars per rehearsal as payment to participate in this choir. Uh, this came out of the popularity of the movie Sister Act, and there's a this strong desire amongst Japanese people to learn how to sing black gospel music. Um, so this is all of us at the final concert. As you can see, there's a lot of people on stage, so we were all very close. Um, but from a distance, this is all you could see, was like this huge crowd of people that just had so much passion. And there was so much energy about this black gospel music, and it was just crazy to think that half of them, well, about 80% of them didn't believe or understand what they were singing about. Um, as you can see on stage is Ken Taylor directing the choir, but there's also um, four different soloists who are from all over the world who um, take their personal vacations to come um, every year to sing in the choir, um, just to be part of the ministry. Um, even just singing with the Japanese, we could see and feel the effects of this creative but very successful outreach program. We were so glad that we could participate and see it firsthand so that we can tell all of you about it and how it's really working. So one of the biggest forms of transportation we had was riding the train. And in this picture, this is a very um, vague expression on how full it is. Usually it's very, very packed. Um, one of the days we had on the train, it was so full that we didn't think that any more people could get on, but more people kept coming and coming and coming. And uh, we had just enough room to breathe. And when you looked around you, you saw some school kids with their backpacks just buried in all these people. But the nice thing about their backpacks is that they're tall enough so that they can lean their head backs to get air from <laughs> above. Um, so, picture. Um, 
it's yeah, it's so hot there that you can't go very long without something to drink. And luckily, there are vending machines. I don't know every hundred feet that you go on this street. Um, and one of the places that we looked up that we could go see at our time in Japan, um, it said that we should try to go to a vending machine. We weren't really sure what the big deal about that was, but uh, it was pretty cool. You couldn't understand any of the, the names on them, and when you thought you were buying water, you were buying a power drink, and um, <laughs> that was pretty cool. And the food there, I expected to mostly just eat fish and sushi, but <laughs> the food there is very, very good. Um, on the right, we went to a ramen uh, restaurant, and it's very, very small, and you could probably fit about 10 people there, uh, but it's very good, it's very worth going. And uh, lots of McDonald's along the way, and uh, the first few days that we were there, Janet took us to a Denny's, and it's very easy to order your food there because they have English translations, and the Japanese workers are very patient with you, and they can kind of figure out what you're trying to order. Um, and on the days when we were able to do sightseeing, Janet was very gracious to drive us around. And there's the front of the van. She drove on the opposite side of the car, and they drove on the opposite side of the street. And the three of us are in the, in the back. And like Megan said in one of her slides, the streets are so narrow. They look like alleyways. But they're excellent drivers, and they know how to get around each other without really causing any accidents. And they drive fast, and I didn't really see many uh, speed limit signs, but they're very patient with each other and very uh, nice with each other, so we didn't feel dangered at all. Um, and there's, there's Dad. <laughs> and you might think that he's trying to drive the van, but he's in the passenger side. <laughs> uh, this is um, Shibuya. This is the busiest street in all the world. And this is us waiting to cross the street. Um, it's very intimidating, but it's over before it even starts. Um, I was just focusing on getting there in one piece and not losing anybody. But it's, I don't know, it's something that you have to try at least once, I guess. <laughs> um, and we are in the front of the church that we visited Sunday. This is the scuba church. And the pastor is on the right side of that sign with his wife and their son. Um, and it was a very, I don't know, the church, it was fun to go. It was 30 people, um, but we all knew who we were worshiping. And even though we didn't really understand what the pastor was saying, uh, I think we all just felt this peace in our hearts because we were all worshiping the same God. We were gathered in one very beautiful place. And it was just, it was very cool to experience. Um, and this is the, some of the youth that's at that church. Uh, when I first met them, we didn't really say much about our ages, but they're just so mature that I thought that they were all adults and much, much older than us. And they were very welcoming. We were separated from the adults when we all had lunch together, and um, we <coughs> shared as much about ourselves as we possibly could without the language barrier. And uh, they were all just so nice and polite, and they were they were fun. So, um, one of the things that really impacted us was were the people that we met. There are missionaries from all over the world. This is uh, Joseph and Jenny Kwan. They are from Korea, and they're pastoring. He's he's a, a church planter pastoring a uh, Japanese church. And the interesting thing that uh, uh, Ginny told um, Connie was that um, she, when they were there, a Japanese lady came up to her and apologized and asked her forgiveness because when Japan was occupying Korea, they were very um, ruthless in how they treated it. The Japanese were frankly just ruthless with whoever they, they uh, came into contact with when they were prisoners of war or anything like that during the, during the Second World War. And um, 
So, uh, Joseph, when Joseph and Ginny were uh, talking about getting married, he asked her, would you be willing to go to Japan and, and pastor and plant a church with me? And she had to think about it for a while and pray about it for a while because there had been such hard feelings. So she said, clearly, yes, you know, I, I think God wants me to do that. And so it was interesting that God would bring this Japanese lady into her life to kind of begin healing. Now, there are people like Joseph and Ginny. Um, when I was in the, my doctoral ministry class a couple weeks ago, I met a guy that was in Japan at the same time we were, but we didn't know him. But he knew everyone on the team that we, that we met and all the different missionaries. His name is Christian Zebley. He even knows the, the man personally whose home we stayed in. And um, it's a tight-knit community. So that really impacted me. I mean, in Golden, we have other pastors in other churches that we work with. Um, we just had a community worship experience at Buffalo Bill Days. And it's important that we make sure that we are a team. We are working for the same team in the kingdom of God. And it was interesting to see them. This next picture is a, a guy named E.B. Um, Garrett, Garrett called him the man with a hat for every occasion. Um, and E.B. was just a, just a, a delight to be with. Um, we, uh, we saw him in a couple different choirs and um, a couple different other community centers as well. And on the day of the concert, we were walking down the street going to like the 7-Eleven to get our, um, you know, pot stickers with chicken fat on them or whatever. And he said, no, 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 you're going to eat some real food. And he took us down to a curry restaurant and he ordered for us. Mm. And it was some of the best food ever. But he's a, a man who, who loves Jesus with everything that he has, and he just beams with his, his love for Christ. And then in this next one, the lady in the front, her name is Echo, and she is not a believer. She's very open. Everyone that we talked to was very open that they're not believers. But the thing that was interesting th about her was she, she just loved being with us. She wanted us to take a picture with her so we could remember her. And we pray for her. And Trust that God is going to lead her to himself through these choirs and through the different things she, she's going to do. Then we'll, we'll flip through the next three pretty quick here. Here's some friends that Andrea made, and next is friends that Megan made, and then a couple friends that Susie made. <clears throat> and here's a good friend that I made. <laughs> At 7-Eleven, they have um, watermelon popsicles. Yeah. And you can eat the rind. And you can eat the seeds because they're chocolate. And every day on the way back to the place we stayed in, at, it was my honor and joy and duty to, to relieve 7-Eleven uh, of at least one of these. They were really good. And then there were some homeless people walking by. If you can see real close, that, that, that's our girls. And then here, Susie put her arm around a, uh, a samurai warrior. And then this last picture is of Ken Taylor and us. Um, Boy, one of the biggest takeaways for me was just how much Ken Taylor loves Jesus and how much I want to be like Ken. Um, there were so many, he, he chose all the songs, he orchestrated all the music, he did all the stuff. But, but when he talked about why he did what he did, he would tear up every time because he just loves Jesus and he wants other people to love Jesus. And there are so many lessons that we have taken away. But one of the things we've taken away is we want to love Jesus more. And we want us as a congregation to love Jesus more. When we are with a group of people, with 80 to 85% of them don't know Christ, and they sing with such energy and passion, it makes me long for that here. That's one takeaway for me. I really want us to have that kind of energy and that kind of passion. That's why I think trips like this are important. We took this trip because we love Jesus and we wanted to go after the 99%. We also took this trip because we want you to take a trip. We want, as a congregation, to become world Christians. That's why we put this in the bulletin this morning. There are several different trips that you could take. Um, our prayer was that we would have money left in the short-term mission trip fund. 
so that it could be seed money for the next team. Now, I don't know who's going to be on the next team, but I'm praying that one of you will say, yeah, I think God wants me to go. And like I said in the sermon this morning, it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. We're all part of God's kingdom work. And we can all be on trips like these. Every single one of us. We, we didn't have any special skill. None of us are really super great singers. But we were able to be part of a choir. And we didn't go to sing. We went to share Jesus with people who wanted to learn English. And we had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. Susie mentioned the, the homeless ministry. The five guys that wanted to learn English, they were five guys that Mark Bennett had led to Jesus. They weren't just learning English. They were becoming disciples so that they could, as Garrett said, like you, why you, was making disciples. That's what we long for as a team and for our church. So lots more we could say. We've gone over time about 10 minutes. So we're done for now. I'll turn it back over to Janet. But, but we would love to give you more information. We had 1,700 pictures. So, yeah, we've got more we could share, share with you. Uh, question. Yes, Ken. In what language was the Psalms song? Oh, thank you. English. It was all in English. So they were able to translate the black sensitivity. Well, yes. So what Ken would do is he, he would point to them and he'd point to us and he'd say, watch their mouths. Because Japanese people, for instance, would say, you deserve it. And you can't understand it, right? And he'd say, no, no, you put your lips together. You deserve it, right? So he, he did things like that to help them understand um, how to pronounce it. That's, that's why we were there, to help them with that. And really why we were there was to share Jesus with them. Thank you. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. I actually kind of said hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs>